Hi everyone, welcome to the Landscape of the Soul. My name is Ken Macklin. We have been on this journey through the Gospel of Mark and we're about to look at chapter 2, uh, verse 13, uh, right after uh, Jesus forgave the sins and healed the paraplegic and said, I have authority on earth to forgive sins, and they were, they were questioned about that. In this next section, um, he again goes out by the by the sea by the sea now remember the sea in the gospel of mark functions as the fallen human condition remember we talked about him going on the other side of the sea where he encountered the demoniac uh, but the sea is is of galilee is the place of where he did his ministry and then he moves toward jerusalem of course and then he engages in his passion death and resurrection but a part of his ministry as his teaching. Uh, we've seen this in other passages. But here, he uh, he's beside the sea, and the crowds gather about him, and he taught them. And as he passed on, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting by the tax office, and he said to him, Come, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And then, as he sat at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So the question now becomes, uh, why is it that the Pharisees were appalled by the notion that Jesus would eat with uh, tax collectors and sinners? And so one of the ways to understand tax collectors is they were Jews who were hired by the Roman Empire to uh, to exact taxes from the people. And in order for them to make a living, they'd take a little bit off the top. And many of them were uh, doing that unjustly and unfairly. And so they were despised uh, by many of the Pharisees for doing that. And sinners, of course, were people who were deemed unclean or unfit, who were not a part of the community. And so Jesus chooses to eat with tax collectors and sinners. I remember years ago when I was looking at this passage and I was raising the same question, why does ta Jesus eat with sinners and tax collectors? And when I really began to think about that, I realized that if Jesus didn't eat with tax collectors and sinners, he'd be eating alone. So he simply did not want to eat alone. In other words, we are all sinners in need of grace. We are all uh, flawed in one way or another. Uh, we saw this in the healing of the paraplegic and now we're seeing this as he engages uh, the human condition by the sea. And so he's by the sea teaching and then he actually puts into practice what he's teaching by calling Levi to be a follower of his, one of his disciples, Matthew, who was a tax collector. So uh, all of us are in need of some kind of redemption. Uh, so none of us are exempt from being a tax collector or a sinner or uh, the human condition. We are all part of that. Now to, to grasp a, a maybe even a more, more insightful, I want to jump over to, to Matthew because the uh, Sermon on the Mount is not in, in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and, and neither is, are the Beatitudes. So I want to look at the Beatitudes. And, and the reason I want to do this is to indicate that uh, Jesus, one of the things that Jesus is doing, uh, and he does this clearly in, in Matthew, not so much in Mark, uh, is you've heard it said of old, such and such and such, but I say unto you, this is the new revelation of God to uh, the house of Israel. Or this is the new teaching. This is the teaching of Jesus. And so in chapter 5 of Matthew, he sees the crowds, he goes up to the mountain, and when he, when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they 
that uh, they which do not do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are ye, you, this is King James, ye is always plural for you, when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And then he says to us, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its save flavor, uh, wherewith you shall be salted again. It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under feet. So he goes on to talk about this contrasting the old with the new, that he has now come to bring the new. I want to focus on one aspect of the Beatitudes that uh, can help us understand Mark a little bit better, I suppose. So, blessed are the pure, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure, for they shall see God. So, uh, what does it mean to be pure of heart? Uh, in, in other words, how do we see God? Blessed are the pure, for they shall see God. Uh, it, it could mean that if we live our lives in purity, and when we die, we go to heaven, we may see God then. But I don't think that's the point of this uh, this beatitude. I think the point is, is that when we are able to, with pure hearts, uh, see God in other people, uh, they shall see God. And, and, and this is what John says basically. No one has seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God will manifest God's self. In other words, we will be able to see God in our brothers and in our sisters. So in one sense, going back to Mark now, what Jesus is really trying to teach is that we are all brothers and sisters in the human family. And how we treat one another is imperative. And so Jesus, uh, in the way in which Jesus treats us, is to eat with us and sup with us. We do this in the practice of the Sacrament of Holy Communion, for example, where we break bread and drink the cup of salvation. It's a way of eating together with Jesus, acknowledging that we are a part of the sea, part of the human condition in need of grace. That God is a uh, perfect God, perfect love, but working through the imperfection of humanity. Now, why God chose to work through imperfect humanity is something that we will find out by and by, I guess. But that's what God has done. God has chosen to work, perfect God, chosen to work through imperfect means to bring about his message of peace and reconciliation and purity. So, blessed are the pure, which simply means, as Kierkegaard once said, the pu purity of heart is to will one thing, and that is to will the will of God. So as we seek God's will, as we try to understand God's will, and we make that our, our desire, then our hearts will be pure, because I think simply uh, because we'll be able to begin to see God working in our neighbors, working in our communities, God working through other people that we can uh, celebrate. So God chooses uh, through, through Jesus to eat with tax collectors and sinners, and he says clearly, I didn't come to call the well. That doesn't mean that there are some that are well and some that are sick. I think Jesus is really trying to say that we're all sick in one way or another, and we all need redemption, we all need healing, but those who believe that they are above uh, the, the human condition or above the, out of the sea are only kidding themselves. But when we acknowledge, when we acknowledge our humanness and our imperfections, then, then, then there's the occasion for grace to take place in our lives. Then John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and people came and said to them, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? And how? And as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. So in other words, there is this understanding of feasting and fasting. Uh, there's an appropriate time to fast when there's the absence of presence. Uh, and feasting is 
the presence of God. And as long as God is present, then we, we are feasting on the presence of God. But there are occasions in our lives as we uh, make this journey that we become dry spiritually, we feel alone, we feel isolated. And in those moments we fast because it, it, it's not just about fasting from food. I, I always think, I call it mind fasting, getting the noise out of your head getting all the things, the pressures, the stress, the worry, the concerns, the anxiety, trying to fast from that for a moment and take a pause or take a moment, take a moment to reflect upon the presence of God in your life. And as you reflect upon the presence of God, then you are feasting, mind feasting on God's word that enables you to deal with the stresses and the worries and all the things that are uh, plaguing us on a daily basis we have we have there the wherewithal or the tools to be able to withstand to cope or to to embrace that reality so there is a time for f fasting and the fasting is the absence of stuff that's cluttering our souls cluttering our mind and then feasting on on the presence of god or feasting on the word of god and then re-engaging the world, re-engaging all that reality, but with a different set of lenses, a different uh, perspective that enable us to work through. It, just for an example, <clears throat> um, met many people who uh, go through what I call desolation, not, not clinical depression, but desolation. Sometimes uh, they, they experience a lot of loose ends in their lives and they become overwhelmed. And when we begin to fast, it simply means that we take one of those loose strands at a time. Instead of engaging the whole ball of wax, we just deal one strand at a time, nip it in the bud, deal with that, and then we go to the next one. And we're methodical, we're present, uh, our faculties are all intact. And then eventually all those loose wires begin to become more whole and then you don't feel overwhelmed. Uh, you don't feel uh, the anxiety. You begin to be able to understand that this is something that you can engage by taking that pause, taking a step back, fasting, and then being able to feast once again. So uh, in, in this uh, Gospel of Mark, even though I'm trying to contemporize it a little bit, I think the, the principles are the same that uh, eating with tax collectors and sinners, who would, who would those people be in our life? Uh, maybe it's the homeless. Maybe it's the down and out. Maybe it's a, a variety of things. Maybe we need to embrace that and see the humanness of their lives and the suffering. And, and by showing compassion and showing mercy, we are better, better able to identify, you know, as, if it wasn't for the grace of God, there go I kind of thing. And likewise, he goes on to say, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they shall fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, uh, that patch tears away from it, uh, and the old and the worst tear becomes. So we become like new wineskins when we are feasting. Then we can put the wine within that container and deal with, uh, with the, the reality that we're confronted with. So I'm going to leave it there uh, for now, and these are my thoughts for today. I pray that as you pray through the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, that you're also linking this to the Sermon on the Mount, that you take a look at chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew, and through the lenses of that Sermon on the Mount, you're be better able to understand the basic teachings of Jesus his people. So from my heart to your heart, until we meet again, keep reading scripture, keep reading Mark, go to Matthew, learn as much as you can, become all that God has meant you to be, uh, allow God to work in your life. So until we meet again, from my heart to your heart, God's peace and grace be with you. Amen.